Orthopedic surgery became a recognized surgical field of expertise in the 18th century, when French physician and writer Nicolas André coined the term and used it as the title of his 1741 medical manual on the treatment of musculoskeletal deformities. André's term derives from the Greek word orthos, meaning straight, and pes, meaning child. The Greek pace would also go on to form the root for pediatrics. Andre's image of the crooked tree shown here is still the emblem used to signify orthopedic surgery today. Notice how the tree is being straightened through a brace and pulley system, not with an open operation. This image, though still in current use, symbolizes orthopedic surgery as it was practiced before the 20th century. Andre drew from two traditions of knowledge for his medical advice. One came from the long healing tradition known as bone setting. Scholars have found evidence for bone setting traditions across the world, including Western Europe, but also in countries such as East Africa, East Asia, South America, and the Middle East. While the nuances of bone setting techniques varied according to local traditions of healing, bone setters tended to privilege hand-based treatments, believing in the power of manual manipulation to diagnose and treat bone injuries. Another source of knowledge came from generations of army field surgeons who refined operative techniques for emergency amputations, setting fractures, and other battle wounds. Before the discovery of anesthesia and antisepsis, a surgeon's reputation was determined not by technique, but by the speed with which he amputated limbs, set bones, and treated wounds. Scottish surgeon Robert Liston was said to have amputated a limb in only two and a half minutes flat. Amputations in fewer than three minutes were commonplace at this time. With the exception of a Extreme injuries, orthopedic practitioners largely practiced closed or dry surgeries. Closed surgeries corrected the body through mechanical means like bracing, trusses, and exercise regimes. By the late 18th century, there were a number of small private orthopedic institutions, and these were devoted to children with spinal di diseases and deformities. John Almevenel founded the first orthopedic institute in 1780 in Switzerland where he also developed a club shoe for children born with club feet. These institutes, which proliferated in the early 19th century, focused on dry surgeries and the correction of external disabilities. The development of anesthetic gases like chloroform and ether in the mid-1840s allowed surgeons to become more methodical in their work. While anesthetics were controversial and not widely used until much later in the 19th century, some surgeons employed it in procedures like amputations or prolonged operations. The availability of anesthetics prompted an uptick in the rate of orthopedic surgeries and allowed for the development of more complex procedures. Joseph Lister's advocacy of sterilization and antisepsis went even further to make open operations a safe practice. Combined, anesthesia and antisepsis radically changed the landscape of general surgery. However, orthopedic surgeons, who maintained a long-standing professional focus on tuberculosis and other bone diseases, continued to prefer dry surgeries. For example, Dutch army surgeon Antonius Matthijsen published techniques for the incorporation of plaster of Paris in bandages in 1852 after he observed its use in contemporary art. Unlike older materials used in splints like wood, wax, and metal, plaster contoured to the patient's limb and set quickly. Plaster was also relatively inexpensive, ubiquitous, and the resulting bandage was durable all of which were qualities that made it popular after Matheson demonstrated his technique publicly in the 1870s. 
In 1876, American orthopedic surgeon Louis Sayre introduced a method for correcting spinal deformities that featured suspension followed by the application of plaster bandages. His method, shown here, is illustrative of the kinds of treatments orthopedic surgeons followed at the time, generally drawing on a combination of dry surgeries. In 1889, orthopedic surgeons created their own specialized professional organizations, and in America they called it the American Orthopedic Association. Immediately after its creation, heated discussions concerning the identity of orthopedic surgery ensued. Was orthopedic surgery supposed to be defined by the knife? Or was orthopedic surgery a form of manual therapy and heme? While you think over these questions, consider the famous 1793 The Amputation by satirist Thomas Rowlandson. When you consider this image, think to yourself, what do you notice about this image? Most importantly, how does it depict surgeons and the practice of open surgery? Orthopedic surgeons in the late 19th century sought to establish a concrete professional identity, both in relation to physicians and to general surgeons. They tried to differentiate themselves in a number of ways, one of which was to employ the rhetoric of conservative rather than radical surgery. Conservative, in orthopedic circles, meant privileging orthopedic apparatuses over the scalpel. This emphasis served to underscore a clear distinction between modern orthopedic surgeons and the image of their lower class barber surgeon predecessors who were seen as butchers who wielded the scalpel with reckless, gory abandonment. Early 20th century orthopedists sought to show that modern orthopedic surgeries, surgeons were disciplined and calculated employing scientific precision in each task. A conservative approach was widely adopted across medical disciplines, but orthopedic surgeons took it to its extreme, eschewing the scalpel entirely in favor of mechanical manipulation. Writing in 1914, one orthopedic surgeon declared that, quote, radical procedures characterize general surgery, whereas conservation is the watchword of the orthopedic surgeon." End quote. Consider for a moment, what do you think about the conservative approach? How might it compare to your own experiences in advising patients on whether to undergo risky surgeries? Scorn for invasive surgery was widespread during the early 20th century but it did not bring the practice of orthopedic operations to a halt. Most orthopedists performed more operations in practice than they alluded to in their formal pronouncements on the matter. Nevertheless, U.S. orthopedic surgeons wished to emphasize the necessity of mechanical treatment, treating operative work as secondary, inferior to both in both worth and status. The few practitioners who privileged the knife were considered little more than quacks and were routinely denied professional affiliation. For instance, when New York City orthopedic surgeon Russell Hibbs argued that spinal fusions were better than bracing for treating POTS disease in 1904, his preference for the knife over dry surgeries cost him membership to the American Orthopedic Association until well after the First World War. Consider also this slide, taken at a Seattle hospital around 1925. Notice that the patients are outside. This was part of their treatment regime. Many physicians sent patients with tuberculosis, rickets, and other diseases to hospitals in the country. Environmental therapy, in which patients fled congested cities for the open countryside, was a core component of conservative orthopedic treatment. Increasingly, by the second decade of the 20th century, certain orthopedic surgeons believed that for the field to be modern, they needed to shed the strap-and-buckle image of orthopedic surgery. 
They did this in two ways. The first was to pursue arguments similar to Hibbs's. Despite protests among many elite surgeons who insisted that the best way to control scoliosis and other back deformities was through bracing and other external devices. Another orthopedic surgeon, Fred H. Albee, insisted in 1911 that open operations was the most efficient and effective way to heal such defects. Albee developed techniques for the first bone graft and found a way to use bone instead of metals for spinal fusions. Yet orthopedic surgery still lacks standardized operative procedures. Surgeons designed their own tools, refined their own techniques, and used idiosyncratic combinations of metal plates and wear for internal fixations. Even as orthopedic surgeons were coming together in professional clubs and organizations, a strong vein of individualism ran through medical practice. After World War II, Western surgeons had a, an array of new methods and materials at their disposal that made operative surgery a more feasible option for treatment. The advent of antibiotics, safer anesthetics, and the widespread and relatively safe availability of blood transfusions all made surgery appear far more advanced than it had in decades prior. By 1948, orthopedic surgeon Joseph S. Barr could declare that, quote, the art of the brace fitter seems to have yielded its place to the surgical art of the scalpel, end quote. He continued, however, to caution surgeons to exercise consideration and restraint in their decision to operate. On the whole, post-war orthopedic surgery moved away from its individual-based surgical techniques and tools towards more standardized procedures. But this was neither automatic nor inevitable. A good example of how this process occurred is in the global rise of a standardized operative treatment for broken bones, namely osteosynthesis. In 1958, 13 young orthopedic surgeons in Switzerland founded the Association for the Study of Osteosynthesis, or AO for short. They did this to establish a uniform technique for managing fractures. The rise of osteosynthesis as the treatment for broken bones had little to do with efficacy or superiority to other treatments. Far more influential was the web of relationships among surgeons, academic researchers, and industrial engineers that spiraled out of Switzerland across the world. Members of the AO constructed an elaborate network that allowed them to have standardized tools produced for them and more importantly, to exercise control over where those tools were sent. In collaboration with manufacturers and engineers, AO surgeons designed the instrument that the companies then mass produce. In a move that was novel at the time, these tools were constructed in such a way that they could not be mixed with non-AO materials, forcing surgeons to pur purchase AO technologies as complete sets instead of piecemeal. This ensured the standardization of surgical implements, as well as a steady stream of revenue for the AO that would ultimately go toward funding research. AO surgeons worried that technologies in their methods would be misused, the consequences of which would contribute to a lack of faith in their equipment. To combat this, they developed a series of hands-on training courses offered worldwide. Alongside, they established a fellowship opportunity wrote textbooks, and gave multimedia presentations, all of which worked to reinforce the AO's authority in determining proper use of their techniques. Eventually, the AO developed a parallel version of these efforts geared towards nurses and operating room personnel. What is important to note here is the level of care and calculation that went into the efforts to standardize practice and to ensure the success of AO methodologies. At first, osteosynthesis was not universally popular. American physicians in particular opposed it on the grounds that using plates in operative treatment for fractures in the past often resulted in infection or other complications. 
The implications, moreover, of surveillance and standardization chafed against American traditions of individualism. In response to critiques of osteosynthesis, the AO did two things. First, they founded an international branch to sort out how their method could gain acceptance in the U.S. and in the other countries where it also had encountered resistance. Second, they founded a laboratory to study bone injuries and treatments. The conclusions from the commissioned studies, both laboratory and clinical, ultimately validated their techniques, and the AO used these results to justify their project to mainstream medical opinion. In doing so, the AO portrayed themselves as the forefront of a new kind of orthopedic surgery, one that was standardized, science-based, and controlled. Now that you've learned more about the rise of osteosynthesis, consider the following questions. What does it take to convince you of a new surgical technique? Whose stamp of approval do you trust the most? The changes in orthopedic surgery over the middle decades of the 20th century have both reflected and reinforced a symbiosis between surgery, science, and industry. What is remembered as progress, like osteosynthesis, is often the product of methodological engagements by surgeons with industrial interests. The AO drew on a range of resources for their technique, which included laboratory-based experiments, mechanical engineers, biomedical corporations, not to mention the patients on whom they refined their methods. Each of these populations brought a set of interests to bear on the career of osteosynthesis around the world. Dry surgeries are now performed by lower paid allied health professionals, such as physical therapists and orthotists. Training in orthopedic surgery is devoted to orth open operations and the latest internal prosthetic devices. Though this devotion is often unquestioned today, history can show us that most street procedures should not be taken for granted and that they were once controversial and sometimes actively discouraged. The history of orthopedic surgery can seem like a linear march of progress. A closer look, however, reveals that the trajectory of the profession was contingent on the actions of individuals and the social, cultural, and political context in which they lived.